While it may not be the soft drink juggernaut it once was, root beer is still an American icon. And there's no root beer more iconic than Barks. For over 130 years, it sunk its teeth deep in the industry and has refused to let go. But even the strongest hold can't last forever. And as the decades wear on, this old dog is turning out to be more bark than bite. Today, we're pulling the tab on what happened to Bark's bite. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. And let us know in the comments below what bubbly beverage history you'd like to wet your whistle with next. Okay, time for the longest game of root beer tapper in history. Though Barks is over 130 years old, root beer is even older than that. The history of root beer dates back, at least, to the 1700s. European colonists observed that the indigenous people of North America were making tea from sassafras root and a combination of herbs. The tea served a medicinal purpose, apparently curing everything from stomach flus to blood impurity. Europeans began to copy and morph this native practice until the late 1800s, when the first hints of true American root beer were beginning to brew. But if you went to a bar for this so-called beer, you'd be leaving empty-handed. Since it was billed as a cure-all, not unlike its indigenous predecessor, the original root beer was only sold in pharmacies. And it wasn't a drink, but rather a syrupy concoction, just like all the worst medicines from your childhood. Why weren't any of them root beer flavored? Those syrups were often made with sweeteners and plant extracts like birch bark, cherry, coriander, ginger, licorice, vanilla, molasses, sarsaparilla, and that old classic, sassafras. Later on, syrup gave way to a powdered mix, thanks to Philadelphia-based pharmacist Charles Elmer Hires. Hires is credited as the inventor of dry mix root beer, which he then paired with sugar, water, and yeast to create a delicious fizzy drink. Recognizing that people usually prefer their beverages already in liquid form, Hires began to sell the drinks pre-mixed, which is when his business really started to take root. In 1876, he took his invention to the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, where the public turned out to be all about the bubbles. By 1893, thanks to years of stellar sales, Hires was able to take his production and distribution to the next level. He and his family became the first people to put root beer in a bottle, which changed the tide of the burgeoning soft drink craze forever. Suddenly, Hires wasn't the only root beer baron around. Not long after bottling his creation, a man in Mississippi was mixing up something big in a tub in his backyard. Edward Bark and his older brother, Gaston, created the Barks Brothers Bottling Company in 1890 in the French Quarter of New Orleans. The company bottled carbonated water and several soft drinks, the most notable of which was an orange-flavored soda named Orangine, which earned Edward a gold medal at the Chicago's World Fair. But the young Bark was destined for even greater things than World's Fair gold. He had studied as a chemist at Tulane University before setting up shop in Louisiana, and later moved to Biloxi, Mississippi to open the Biloxi Artesian Bottling Works. The second bottling factory kept Bark busy during the winters, and in the summers he returned to his brother in New Orleans. In between traveling, Bark continued to experiment with various alchemical concoctions, dreaming up soft drinks in the hopes that one would have sticky, syrupy staying power. Around 1898, with the help of a young man named Jesse Robinson, Bark found just the thing, a bubbly beverage they called Bark's Root and Herb Brew. Why such a circuitous name? Well, back in Philadelphia, Charles Hires was attempting to trademark the term root beer. He'd lose that battle eventually, but for now, Barks has to get a little creative with their naming conventions. Thanks to their pre-established bottling factories, Barks' Root and Herb Brew was able to go into production immediately. However, after some early advertising, they decided to shorten the name to just Barks. It's still unknown exactly where the drink was first created. Since Bark traveled between the Louisiana and Mississippi factories so frequently, the true location remains a mystery to this day. What isn't a mystery is how the drink got popular. It stood out from the pack by containing caffeine, using less sugar, and being more carbonated than its competition. It also rejected the common sassafras base and swapped it for a sweeter sarsaparilla taste. Bizarrely, one of the reasons it became a popular root beer is also the reason it technically isn't root beer at all. By containing caffeine, Barks is actually closer to a soda. But since the taste is more akin to root beer, that's what it became known as to the general public. 
Barks and Robinson priced each six to eight ounce bottle at just five cents, so everyone could get a chance to taste it. And taste it, they did. Marketing to the common people proved to be the right strategy. The drink's popularity quickly caught on. In the 1920s, during Prohibition, root beer sales skyrocketed as an alternative to alcohol, and Barks started offering their products in cans. In 1931, with bottles back on offer, Barks' son Edward II convinced him to switch from six and eight ounce bottles to a large 12 ounce one. They adopted the iconic diamond-necked bottle shape in 1935, as well as a simple slogan, drink Barks, it's good. And by 1937, Barks had erected 62 bottling factories across 22 states. That same year, Edward Bark made enough money to completely buy Robinson out of the business. But they struck a unique franchising deal, allowing Robinson to operate a bottling business in New Orleans and sell Bark's products in a limited area within Louisiana. They wrote up an official contract, shook hands, and remained friends and business partners for the rest of their days. But in 1946, Robinson's bottling business changed its name to Barks Beverages, Inc. This one act set the stage for a long and grueling legal battle 40 years later. In 1987, Barks' remaining heirs filed a trademark infringement lawsuit against Barks Beverage, Inc. They claimed the business was illegally operating under the Barks name, which they had no rights to. After some dramatic deliberation, the case was ultimately dismissed. Why? Because the 1935 contract signed by Edward Bark and Jesse Robinson stated that Robinson wasn't just a franchisee, but rather a co-owner. And as long as Bark's Beverage Inc. only operated in Louisiana, nothing was being infringed. The two co-owning companies had no choice but to continue selling Bark's products side by side until 1995, when Coca-Cola swooped in and bought the brand outright. Before the Coca-Cola buyout, Barks continued to use their simple four-word slogan, Drink Barks, it's good. But while their marketing may not have changed, their product line certainly did. Over the years, Barks has produced a number of thirst-quenching beverages, some of which are still around today, and many of which came in diet or caffeine-free varieties. There's the classic Barks root beer, a spiced cherry flavor, red and yellow cream soda, French vanilla cream soda, and Barks floats which were made to taste like a root beer float. With over 100 years of production, Barks had become a national sensation. Before long, larger soft drink companies finally took notice, and the Coca-Cola company stepped in to slurp up the competition. Under new management from Coke, Barks abandoned its classic slogan for a hip new advertising venture. The Barks Has Bite commercial campaign aimed to bring the brand into the mid-1990s with a radical new strategy. The ads featured a Barks salesman going door to door or standing on the street telling people that, you guessed it, Barks Has Bite. After tasting the delicious sarsaparilla flavor, the person would have some sort of extreme reaction indicating a caffeinated blast of energy. Notably, the salesman was played by a then-unknown Nick Swartzen, who would go on to be a stand-up comedian, screenwriter, and actor in just about every early 2000s comedy you can think of. Yep, that one too. However, while Barks enjoyed some sweet years of success, the root beer bubble was bound to burst. Around the same time as Barks was brewing, a&W sloshed onto the scene as well, while the modern root beer inventor, Charles Hires, was eventually left in the dust. Barks and A&W vied for the top spot, a battle with no conclusive winner, even after over 100 years. While the caffeine in Barks technically disqualifies it from being root beer, thirsty consumers care about that as much as they did back in the 1890s. That is to say, they don't care at all. Barks regularly shows up on lists ranking root beers, and it's one of the most recognizable brands out there. But that isn't saying much. Other than the iconic Barks Bite ad campaign, which ended around 20 years ago, very little money is spent on marketing root beer to the average grocery shopper. With the deluge of soft drinks available on store shelves today, root beer can't compete. As such, it's only moderately popular outside highly specific demographics, like Mormons who down the drink in obscene amounts since many don't consume alcohol or caffeine. So traditional root beer is right up their alley, just as long as they stay away from Barks and its caffeinated bite. There's also a market for small boutique brands of root beer untouched by the monstrous conglomerates that are Coke and Pepsi. You could probably find at least one regional brand in your local grocery store. But outside of these niches, 
root beer simply doesn't float, unless you're reading Coke's website. According to them, Barks still has bite after all this time. Maybe bring back Nick Swartzen? Just be sure to catch him in between Adam Sandler movies. So what do you think? Does Barks have bite, or does it leave you feeling flat? Let us know in the comments below and check out some of these other videos from our Weird History Food.